All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Multiple Choice with Ozobot. We are so excited to have everyone with us here today. Um, my name is Melissa Tui. I am the Ed Tech and Adoption Specialist here at Ozobot. I'm joined with um, Cassandra Willer, who is our Content Manager. Um, and today we have two um, exemplar uh, certified educators, uh, Laura Newell and Lisa Richardson, who are joining us, and they're going to host um, this amazing webinar all about using multiple choice. Um, so quickly, I'm gonna go through my agenda so that they have plenty of time to share their content with you. Um, we're gonna go over some housekeeping items. We have some polls for our audience. Um, then we'll introduce Laura and Lisa and uh, dive into their content. And then we'll have Q&A at the end. So um, just to let all the participants know, um, if you are here as a participant, as an audience member, um, you're on mute and your camera is off. If you have um, questions, please use the Q&A feature. Um, we will be circling back to that um, for Laura and Lisa to answer at the end of the webinar, or you can pop them in the chat if you wanna start a discussion. If you are using the chat feature, please remember to select all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see. Um, we love to use that chat as a discussion for teachers to, uh, or educators or um, whatever context you're in to just start a discussion and to connect and to share ideas. Um, we also have Ozobot members monitoring that chat so we can answer any questions from our side um, that are relevant. Great, so we're gonna jump into the polls. We would love to see um, who we have in our audience um, today. Uh, you should see a poll pop up. I'll give everyone about 30 seconds. We'd like to know how familiar everybody is with Ozobots. About 10 more seconds. All right, I'm gonna share those results. It looks like we're kind of on both ends of the spectrum. So a lot of us own or use them um, and some of us are brand new. So we're on both ends of the spectrum, but I think you'll learn a lot from both Laura and Lisa today. Um, you'll get a lot of ideas. Great. Uh, grades, we'd love to know what grades everyone teaches. I'll give everyone about 30 seconds to complete this poll. All right, it looks like, uh, oh, whoops, let me share that. Looks like most of us are in three to five, but we're kind of spread out all over um, K through 12 and high school. Um, so that is wonderful. And then our last poll question is, uh, what subjects are you teaching? Everyone, about 10 more seconds to answer that poll question. All right, great. And it looks like we're spread out evenly through the STEM areas. So that is really, really wonderful. I think the content today um, is really going to be beneficial no matter what er subject area you are teaching. So I am going to go ahead and introduce um, Laura Newell, who is a second grade teacher, and Lisa Richardson, who are uh, who is a high school math teacher. They're our hosts today. Um, Laura, would you like to tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Okay, so I'm Laura, and I've been teaching for six years. I taught sixth grade science, fifth grade math and science, and now I'm in second grade. Um, I live in Texas, so yeah. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. And Lisa, um, would you like to let everyone know a little bit about yourself? Me. Okay, uh, I'm Lisa. I am a high school math teacher also in Texas. And uh, I'm sitting in the dark because I'm going to do a projection and it looks weird. So I don't want y'all to think I just sit around in the dark on webinars. Well, sometimes I do, but that's it. Uh, but I do teach high school math. I teach all grades because of my math level too. Thank you so much. Great. So I just wanted to highlight that um, both Laura and uh, Lisa are our certified educators. So you can check out their, um, you can check out all the lessons that um, educators have, con have contributed into our lesson library um, in Ozobot Classroom. But um, if you want a short link to Laura's lessons in particular, she has a 
lesson about rock textures, um, energy, and fractions, you can go to ozo.bots slash um, Laura with a capital L. Um, and same with Lisa. Lisa has um, uh, six lessons in our lesson library. Um, geometry, space stations, uh, quadratics. Uh, actually have a, I think I have a couple of more now too. Oh, okay, great. So I'll, yeah. I'll have to, um, you can actually see them also. It's not just these six that you will see when you go to mm -hmm. ozo.bot slash Lisa with a capital L. Um, you'll see all of her lessons. So it, And I did want to tell them all of these um, names or titles in this uh, on this slide have links to my personal blog where I've gotten a little more detailed on trial and error and stuff like that as well. I put a lot of it into the actual lessons, but it's there also in case you get blocked from something at school, you can access them there too. That's wonderful. Yes. And I think um, Cassie is, uh, has mentioned in the chat, but in case you're not looking at the chat, um, these slides will be available on our webinar page for you to access um, once once uh, these materials are available in the next few days. So you can always come back and um, reference these. And we'll talk about that um, at the end of the webinar as well. So what I'll do now is I'll stop sharing so I can hand it over to Lisa and um, Laura and they'll take it from here. Thanks for joining us this morning. I think you're on mute, Lisa. Yeah, Laura's first, I believe, and I forgot to pull up my slide deck, so let me go fix that. <laughs> Laura? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Let me share that. Can you guys see that? All right. So um, we came up with the idea of doing multiple choice questions with the Ozobots. And I started it because it was engaging and it's fun and it's more student centered. So they don't just think of it as like just taking another assessment. They see it as, you know, a fun activity to do. And my students get so excited when they see the Ozobots. So it just kind of is more exciting to them and not just kind of boring for an assessment um so the first one i did was a multiple choice question so how i did this was i used stem scopes for science um so i didn't publish this lesson lesson because of copyright but i just came up with a list of questions for the kids and then i made them a pathway because they're they're second grade so it was a more of an intro type thing and i kind of i drew arrows for them because that's like one of the biggest struggles is they like they'll do their uh code wrong because they could just look at it face on but i gave them um all the questions and they had to go through and answer all the questions and then they would color in um the matching the abc uh for whatever the question was so at the bottom i gave them like if it was a they had to do turbo b was nitro and c was snail um that is totally up to you like what code you want them to do but it was something that they could turn in and then i could grade it if i wanted um, they could also turn in just the answer choice, but it was exciting for them. So you can either create the pathway for them or have them create the pathway themselves. Um, is kind of what I was thinking with that. Um, and it was their first one, so I did it for them. So what I did when I did it was I gave all the students the questions. So they had to answer those first seven questions first, because I didn't want them just to get, you know, overexcited and just start coloring their little codes in. Um, and then they came and showed me and then I was able to check them. And so the kids that got it wrong, I did a reteach like right then and there with them. And the ones that didn't, I let them go and start coloring uh, the pathways. And again, it's up to you and what your works for your kids. Um, and then they got to come back and they completed the pathway. And this is when I had um, the school Ozobot. So we didn't have as many. So I would, you know, have them set up the teacher table and I would let them play with it like three times. And some of them would do it backwards just to play around. Um, but it was really fun for them. And then when they finished, they got to go on the back of the paper and draw their own codes that they could test out um, at the end of class. So that's how I did it with the pathway in multiple choice. And then with Ozo Blockly, there's a lot of ways you can do this. So you can create the questions and it really depends on like how many Ozobots you have, but you could put the questions on like Google Slides and post it on the board and they can go through one by one or you could print it out like I did or you could read it when I I say read it I mean like I was thinking if you have your answer choices instead of A, B, C, D, if you have like a half a fourth and an eighth you could be like okay now go to the the fraction that shows a half 
or show the one that shows an eighth and that you know so they could use the ozo blockly to direct um the ozo bot to the the answer choice that's correct um so it's really you can decide if it's at their one question at a time or at their own pace um and i always thought it would be fun like when they get there they can have the little ozobot do an action so it could spin or it could light up whatever you think and like i would give them like maybe freedom to choose or here's your options to choose from here um, and then the, the teacher would walk around and monitor at this time you could also do this as small group whatever you think is best like if it's a math class and we the kids are at stations you could pull your five and have them do it a little bit easier to monitor and you can answer questions but the kids love it and I love it. It's fun for them. And so, yeah. And, and I like, I like the one that Laura did cause it's like really generic. And for any of you guys that have used Ozobot in your classroom, when you do the intro, it really is easier to start with a three color code than a four color code. And it is easier to get them to work on those grids. So I like the fact that it's set out. Um, as far as she was saying, they could create their own map and stuff. One of the things, or one of the um, issues you have with that is they had to have practiced before they create their own. There needs to be lots of play and, and lots of practice the first go around before they um, actually start their freehand coding. So like she said that she lets them play, but I like that one because all you need is some multiple choice questions, which I mean, if I believe all states do standardized testing, I just know Texas because you know we're Texas people. And um, so I like it that it can be used for anything. So you're, full, you're fully integrating that STEM factor in there. Um, I wanna start my little, I guess, my little spiel about um, administration. You know, good administrators are gonna see that connection there and how it's following directions, it's troubleshooting. It's doing all those different kinds of things. And if you are lucky enough to have administrators, they will support it and they will see the value in it. But if not, we have it written into the lesson plans or you can ask Melissa and she will help you out with it or get with one of us CEs from another state or from your state and we can help you out because there's there's I mean just doing something as simple as what Laura showed you covers like 10 ISTE and CSTA things there's troubleshooting there's forming a plan in Texas we have something called process standards you're covering a lot of those process standards in there they have to choose the tools choose the options and a lot of people might not see it that way, but you're getting those objectives covered. So I just kind of wanted to go on my little, my little thing about that, because a lot of people are like, well, this is just playing, this is just toys. This is a lot of different math that you're covering in this. And I think it's important to recognize that. So if you need help, let us know, and we would be happy to, to find out what you need to cover that TEAG or your standards in your state. So now we're gonna get on to me, and I'm gonna attempt a live demo here of what I expect from my kids. I did a lot of creating um, on quarantine. One of our participants here knows me and I do not sit around well. So I have been brainstorming. I did a Twitter chat with Ozobot yesterday and I already emailed Melissa about, I have an idea, you know, and it's just, I love being able to create and practice. And, and so this is a new activity that I decided to try where I'm integrating actually Ozoblocky in. So you're gonna actually see us using Ozoblocky in here and what, the um what my expectations are for my high school students now i believe protractor comes in in sixth grade maybe fourth or fifth in texas i'm not sure so using a protractor is necessary for mine right now um but you could also have it predetermined for them and then you can definitely differentiate which I'll talk about at the end, or I'll probably talk about during. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with this. All you need is a piece of paper, a protractor, a pencil, and an Ozobot. And um, I'm blessed to have a classroom set of Ozobots. Our school has them. A lot of people in our district have them. So here's my other thing. Contact your elementary schools, contact your intermediate schools if you're a high school teacher. I bet somebody has them. And I bet they're sitting in a library or something somewhere if nobody's using them. And I'm sure that they will let you check them out. So definitely take advantage of that. Um, there's also a new Ozobot program, which I'll let Melissa go into later about a one-on-one -on -one thing, which mm -hmm. I don't know if my district would get for me, but I would love to use it and be able to send it home with my kids um, because I was able to do distance learning with Ozobot this break. And so that was a lot of fun too. 
So let's talk about what I'm gonna look at here. So all I did was, I'm gonna share, okay. All I did was I created an A, B, C, D one. We have four options on our standardized test. If you teach seniors, you could do five for the SAT or anything like that. Um, my vision is to have students work in groups to get the measurements for each answer option. You can each have them all do their own and then combine it on one paper for the testing because they are kind of difficult and I would like them to have somebody to check their work with. Um, you can project any multiple choice question on the board. So you do not just need math for this. You can do any subject. But if you do my lesson, you're integrating math into your subject if you make them actually do these um, activities as well and do what I'm gonna show you guys. And then all you're gonna do is have the students code Ozobot to the correct letter. My vision in high school was they would race. And so there's some parameters you would have to look at there, but you could also do that every group that gets it right, you know, gets credit as well. There's a lot of different options here. Like when I saw Laura's, I already immediately thought of like five things I could do with it. So there's just a lot of different options, but basically this will work for any subject. So yeah, uh, will is, you go to, sorry, go ahead. So this is definitely doable for elementary, like, you know, just have them do it in table groups, like groups of four, and mm -hmm. you might rotate who do, types in the block, um, mm -hmm. the code, but you could totally do it. And uh, you just write down the angles for them. Just yeah. give it to them. Mm -hmm. All right, could you go to the next slide, Melissa? I think you're controlling the slides, aren't you? All right, so for my prior knowledge, I've listed all this for you guys. Y'all can come back and look at it. You may um, contact me on Twitter or whatever, and I can email you all of my, uh, if you want my little templates here that I've already created, that's fine, because they're not really a lesson to submit to the lesson thing. Um, I guess I could write them up later, but you're welcome to have all these. I share everything. Um, and I like adding the element of racing to the answer because I teach high school kids. I teach a lot of boys and they love to race. So I thought that would be neat. Maybe for additional points, they could be the first one to the group. So there's some other parameters you'll have to look at there. And I listed them down for y'all too. So if we'll go to my next slide, I think that's ready. Okay, so here's my, oh, I did put a link in there for y'all to download the sheet. So there you go. When, when they share it, it's in there. Sorry. That was like three days ago. I slept. <laughs> So here is a picture of what my vision is. And I just started playing around with Evo a lot and playing around with Ozo Block Eater in the break. So I am going to go on ahead and screen share if I can. Yeah. And I am going to screen share my ladybug with you guys, I believe. Let's see. I want to, there we go. Okay. And I have an extra one set up to make sure you're seeing what I need y'all to see. All right, so here is my paper. Here is my ladybug. And I do think that there would definitely need to be some, some guided practice in this. I made four or five templates. So the first time you do it, you can give them guided practice on it. And on the next one, it's all mixed up. They're different distances. Um, how many times would I use it? I probably would use it in the classroom two, maybe three times. You don't wanna take the fun out of something either. You know, if they're into it, you could use it more, but it'll work with any multiple choice, but this is gonna take up some time. So if you're wanting to get through like a whole standardized test, this is probably more of an option for five to 10 questions, depending on your age group. No, it does, um, I just saw that Patricia asked a question. No, it does not have to be straight lines. It can be, um, it can be curved. I did another answer option on the slide before where I would tell them you can't go through a letter because that's answering that letter. So they would have to actually turn and program Ozobot around another letter. There is a lot of different options you guys can do. You can design your paper for however you want. I download lots of fonts. So I'm kind of a font junkie. So that's why mine is like this. So one thing that is important is the direction you start Ozobot and where his wheels are. Where his wheels are is his travel distance. So I did a several different options and the one I actually shared with y'all had a dot right here. So there's my measurement point and it has a line of where you wanna put Ozobot's feet. And you can extend or do this however you wanna explain with directions. Sometimes kids need more, sometimes they need less. This is a one that I had printed up when I went to school, but naturally we can't get into our school anymore. So it's a kind of an older template, but I, I think it's neat to have somebody actually show you as opposed to playing a video. That way y'all can immediately ask a question or stop me if you have a question, please. Um, so I'm gonna have them do letter D for a reason, which I will show y'all on Ozoblocky, but let's just say that this is our first answer. So the first thing, and I would have the kids all do the measurements 
and everything beforehand. I would not have them doing this while they are answering the questions. I would have all of this ahead of time. So I'm going to draw my line and I want to apologize. I hate this protractor. It's hard to see, but it's all I could find during quarantine. And so they have to travel from here to here. Now I would let them know that Ozobot measures in um, meters or centimeters, excuse me, in millimeters. So they need to measure this. And I would say in centimeters first then convert to millimeters for the program. So I'm gonna go measure my line down from the center in the line and there's 10 centimeters. And then I want it to go into the D. So I'm gonna say six. So I'm gonna say that this line was 16 centimeters, which is how many millimeters, guys? And this is great for lower level math when they have to do those conversions and stuff. And I mean, even conversions for high school, it's still quick mental math. So that would be 160 millimeters. Please stop me if I make a mistake. <laughs> and that's how far he's gonna have to travel to get to the D, but here's the question, all right? When he starts, you wanna make him facing straight. And it's important you determine that with your kids because we're talking about angles now. And I made this mistake the first time I did the um, toilet paper one. I had to think about where's he turning from? Where is he doing it? Cause I would take this and I think what kids will do is they're gonna take this, they're gonna line it up and they're gonna measure, oh, it's 126 degrees. But that's 126 degrees he's turning if he's facing this way. So he's actually facing this way. So what you're actually measuring from is straight up. So we got 100 and let me double check that. I want to measure it again just to make sure. Okay, so I did get about 126. All right. So if I'm measuring him straight up from that, and I got 126 degrees, he's actually facing straight up there. So this is actually straight, he's actually facing, and this is a lot of lesson going on here with different grade levels. He's actually at 90 degrees, but we measured 126. So what are we actually looking for, guys? We're looking for the difference. What's the difference? You can teach it in two different ways depending on your district. You either have 90 plus what equals 126 or 126 minus 90, okay? So on that, I get 36 degrees, right? So I would teach it as an equation because I'm high school and that's a 36 degree turn. So if y'all notice what I did, it's the difference from that straight of the direction he's doing. There's gonna be a lot of learning going on the first time you do this. And so I can see that this might be intimidating for other subjects. You could also have some of this stuff pre-done out for them. And you could have some of it pre-made for them and they just have to measure. So it doesn't always have to come this technical. Okay. So now we need to program him to start here and answer level D and answer question number D. So I'm going to screen share back with OzoBlocky and how to access OzoBlocky. And let me do a new share. So I'm going to go from the beginning. And if you just Google Ozo Blocky, it'll take Blockly, it'll take you to it. If you have classroom computers, it saves the program from before. So you definitely want to delete it. So I'm going to go into Ozo Blockly and I want to just get started down here. There we go. There we go. The first time you go into it, it will um, usually bring up like a little, do you want a tutorial and stuff? So now I'm in Ozo Blockly and I'm doing angles and degrees. So you actually have to go up to number four. Uh, if you upload my lesson over Hermione's hijinks or the toilet paper one, it reminds you of all this stuff as well. So for movement, we're gonna move and we need to rotate the angle. The earlier steps in Ozo Blockly, they just have slight ref, slight right. And those are 45 and 90 degrees set. Okay, so we wanna actually do a specific one. So I'm gonna bring my move block out and I'm gonna bring my rotate. And I want him to rotate first, so I'm gonna put that up here. 
And I found out that you could also do trial and error and not warn the kids about straight north and have them do 126 degrees and see if they can troubleshoot around that. There's a lot of individualized learning going on there and, and, and kind of toughing it out. So I'm gonna do 36 degrees, okay? And I want him to move 160 millimeters. And I'm gonna hit enter, uh-oh. I know that Ozobot, I would have my kids discover this, can only move between negative 128 and a positive 127. So I need to break this block up. So I'm gonna right click and duplicate it. And I'm gonna make my math easy and I'm gonna do 120. And I'm gonna do 40. So right there, you've actually covered, um, you've actually covered a one-step equation. And, um, or with math, multi, um, adding and subtracting up to three digits. So you've covered teaks as well. Um, and so I'm gonna run my program. So I'm gonna bring the Ozoblockly up. I can't show y'all me actually uploading it, but what's gonna happen is you're gonna put him on the screen and he is not, oh, calibration complete. We're just gonna say he is. And I'm gonna load Evo. And it's gonna blink a code onto him and he's blinking green right now. And it says that it's loaded. So I'm gonna put him on the paper. And I'm going to go back to my projector. I had to practice this yesterday. And I'm back on my paper. And remember, you guys can watch this video later and do it at your own thing. So I'm going to play it. And I think Melissa knows what's going to happen here because it's a mistake I made before with the angles. So I'm going to turn him on. And to get him to run the program, you have to double click twice. And I have a little issue with this sometimes. Um, I'm kind of moving a little bit and stuff like that. The kids will start to learn those differences or how careful they need to be. Or you can even have them program a pause at the beginning so that you can get your hands away. So I'm going to double click him. What? Wait a minute. He went left instead of right. He went counterclockwise instead of clockwise. So I'm a big proponent of the opposite in my math class. He needs to go the opposite of 36 degrees. What is the opposite of 36 degrees, guys? And so I would have them go back. So this is like your first lesson on he needs to go the other direction. And they need to add that negative into there because you want him to travel the other way. So you just need to go hold him back up and reprogram him to run the code again. Takes about six seconds to download. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a second too. I'm gonna to show you guys something as a warning instead of making sure you don't just go like I would have done and assign it first. And, all right, so now I'm gonna put him on here and turn him on. Okay, double click. And now he goes the right direction and goes to the correct answer. So this has a lot involved in it. As you can see, it'll take some time. I would probably have them do all the measurements the day before, and then we would answer the questions the next day. Now, I'm gonna do something a little bit different, and he can actually say words at the end, okay? And I'm gonna go back to Ozoblocky. I'm sorry, I know I'm switching back and forth, but I wanna show y'all exactly what I'm doing instead of just telling y'all. So I'm gonna go back to Ozoblocky, and I want him to say something because I'm just that teacher. So I go to Sounds, and Sounds has stuff like, play happy, play sad, surprise, laugh. Those are all good. And something else that's really important to note is when I added this sound in, it only added one second to my download time to load it onto Evo. When you go into light effects, and I think this is important to know, like I was like, oh yeah, I want them to do something. Let me go back to like first and second grade. They have all these fun ones. Like, ooh, I want it to do rainbow. When I move rainbow over automatically, you might notice right here, it has, they have to hold it against the screen for 23 seconds. My students don't do anything for 23 seconds straight usually. So I think it's really, really important that y'all note that a sound might take the time up a whole lot. And so just a fair warning, because I would have made that mistake. I totally would have assigned it to my students and it, some of them will take it up to, I think disco takes it up to like a minute. and I'm not going to, I'm, I can't do that. So I'm going to delete the block. <laughs> if uh, I can jump in here with yes. some creative things that I've seen teachers do. Yep. Um, or students, they figured out um, with that flash loading, some students have, um, they've actually taken their laptop and put their screen 
um, they kind of flipped it so the screen is mm -hmm. against the table and then they place yeah. the, the bot um, up against it so they don't actually have to use their arm to hold it up. Um, so that's been a super creative way that um, has eased that process a little bit. And then also for any students that have access to iPads, if you download um, the Evo app or, or any tablet, um, there's the Evo app, which will Bluetooth connect um, directly to the Evo, which makes it a little bit easier as well so they, that they can run yeah. the program directly to Evo. So for any educators that are wondering about that, those are some easy ways to um, ease the process a little bit. Yes, and I definitely think that would be good if you're not like wanting to get through a certain amount and stuff too, you know, and so that's just something. But I want Evo because I'm a goofball to say I'm right when I'm done. So I'm actually going to have him say the direction right when he's done with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to load him with this. So I'm going to take my headphone off and kind of light it up over there. And I tested this earlier. So hopefully you guys can hear that he's actually going to do a little celebration at the end and and light up or say what's correct because I would make my kids do that <laughs> because that's just who I am. So let me go back over and reloading. But do watch that time for download because some kids might get creative and if they're racing, they might pick the wrong one. All right. So, and when he loads, he does say, yeah, really loud. It's kind of cute. So let me try this. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Were y'all able to hear it a little bit? Okay. So that is kind of my idea of a lesson. There's a lot of different options that that you guys could do here. You could mix these all up. You could have numbers. Um, for converting fractions for lower grades, you could have your main fractions and they have to travel Ozobot to the main answer. I think once they actually like did all these measurements and stuff, you could really do a lot with this. You could have them keep it for another day that you're gonna pull them out and just practice the online testing. Um, one caveat that you do wanna make sure is that uh, you can access Ozoblocky from your school. Uh, units because I made that mistake. I did an assignment and everything and I was all excited and I'm like, I don't know if kids can actually uh, access it. So that's something um, uh, you can do. Pat, no, it's not blocked by CCISD. So this is not blocked by our district and our district is really strict about everything. So hopefully it's open on y'all. This is definitely something I feel like y'all could put in a request for uh, to get it unblocked as well. So uh, if you'll go back to the slides, I think I'm done with my, my live demo. Let me ask real quick, did anybody have any questions for me? I missed it, Cassie. I wasn't looking at it the whole time. Or Melissa, were there any questions for anything here? I don't see any other questions. Okay. Whatever, uh, make sure you are, uh, you're allowed to ask questions so you can ask them in the chat in the Q&A. Okay. So first, if I were doing this for second grade, since we don't do the protractor, and we don't really do degrees, I would probably have them do the slight left, slight right, that way maybe have like A and, or B and C at the slight left and right, and then A and D. So actually, like, and program it at 45 degrees yourself yeah. and 90 degrees, that's great. Yeah, and I mean, with second grade, they can put numbers in order and just kind of like, you just kind of have to, they do know how to measure, and so that, just make sure their centimeters are right, and I would probably give them the conversion for them, but I think, you know, it's definitely adaptable for elementary school. And I think for intermediate and high school, I doubt there's an intermediate or high school that would not like you to help kids measuring with the protractor. And I think that they would sit down with you and show you how to do it if you're not sure. And, or, you know, come and ask me, come watch this video. I can't imagine that nobody would help y'all because they want the kids to get those skills. And then you've got that cross-curricular check mark on your uh, mm -hmm. observation and everything. So I think that that's, that's something good too. I like the doing the slight right, slight left for kids. And then you could actually mix up the letters. So it's not the same thing for each letter. Um, I would not have them, I would have them definitely do the math ahead of time. And I would leave one mat per day of questions, I think. I don't think I would pull out multiple mats until maybe we've done them all. And then you could really throw off those high schoolers and say, all right, we're going to do this one today uh, or pull this out for the next question so they don't have it all memorized at that point. 
Yeah. And for, you know, I was always thinking you could always do this in a mass station. Um, and then they could, if we use seesaw a lot and they could record their little, Oza bot doing the activity, um, and post it on seesaw and then their parents can see it too. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And it's definitely something that's fun to put pictures of and, and kids enjoy it. And I had, a, I had, I did a assignment. Um, this is one of my happy moments. I did an assignment and my last assignment of the week was send in something that you enjoyed doing throughout the year. And I had a kid that kept the Ozobot video from the first week of school and sent that video into me as his something he enjoyed doing. So they definitely like them and like to play with them. Um, I think one of the common questions we get asked in webinars, and I like to answer it now is how often do you use them? I'm going to probably use them a lot more next year because I'm going to integrate them into stuff, but I know it's not every day. It's maybe not even every week. Uh, it's when it's valuable to my class. I, I'm really bad about biting off more than I can chew. And if anybody's been in a webinar, they know I'm like that. And I want to create all these things and make them do all this stuff. And I'm like, wait, step back. I can just integrate this twice a year to start off with. And then next year I'll do it three times. And now I have two major grades I use Ozobot for in my math class. So it's just, it's been a work in practice. I've been using them for about four years now. So I just feel like this is a good time to get all this stuff kind of started and on your brain for next year. Uh, but it's definitely applicable across levels, across uh, curriculum. I think it can be used in a lot of stuff. So if you want to go to our slide, I'm going to stop sharing. And I have some differentiation notes kind of for me and Laura. I kind of put them together and she looked at it and that we could screenshot about I think that's my next slide I'm not um so some of the differentiate is they could decide what code for each letter like with Laura she did the set codes for them they could you can let them decide which one it is and especially like if it's a race they would have to use logic like wait a minute a tornado is going to take a lot longer than a zigzag or something so there's some some stuff in there um as Laura said, they could freehand draw their answer map, or if you're in star review, I'm sorry, that's our standardized test, they could do a poster size paper of it and make their own map of all the answers. And like if you're in reading, they could incorporate it into Romeo and Juliet and have scenes at each stop. Or if you're in history, it could be a timeline of World War II or whatever you're studying at that time. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that I feel like you could put into that. If you're a computer science teacher, lucky you, it all works. <laughs> uh, but if you're computer science, you could also get a story or a timeline from history and have them work it into that. So you're doing that cross-curricular. Um, you can provide a checklist of codes they need to use. So like Laura did with hers, if they have a map, you can say, all right, you have to use these codes um, throughout your puzzle at each answer or something like that. Just an idea. And for the math version, I've already told you, you could have them lines pre-drawn, pairs or group. So if you really want to step it up a level for my intermediate school teachers, or is this elementary? I think this is elementary. You can measure them in inches and then have them convert it to millimeters. That's some definite high level for all grade levels and, and me alike. Um, and you could also have them only use positive numbers for angles. So I kind of showed you my mistake I made in the first and I had to go back and put the negative. You could have them figure out, oh, wait. And so you're doing multi-step equations. They have to spin a whole 360 degrees plus this, or it has to spend 180 minus this. So there's a lot of different things that you could do there as well. They could only use double digits, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, and then with, like, for lower level, if you do a guided reading and you want them to retell it, you could have them do their freehand to, like, retell the what story happened in their little guided reading book. Um, yeah. And there's so much you can do. And, like, I know we've done stuff where they, they, go, they have to pause and there'll be, like, a little QR code that they scan and it tells them, you know, it's like a little video or something they watch or an article they have to read. Um, you can always do that just to make it more exciting for them. This is such wonderful content. Um, I know I have some questions and I would love to know um, when a teacher's trying to roll this out, this is such like engaging and thoughtful content and it's so meaningful. Um, what are some almost like roadblocks that you kind of had to hurdle over um, that teachers might want to anticipate and plan for ahead of time? Was there anything um, that comes to mind that you can share? Um, with me, the, 
the kids, sometimes they color their order wrong. Like on the, that's why I had them choose like ABC for each question mm -hmm. first. Um, so they might mess up when they color. Um, so I would always kind of try to tell them like, okay, let's do all the, the blue markers first. And maybe like they could get a pencil and write, mm -hmm. like fill it in like red, green, and have them blue. turn their paper. The direction he's yeah. traveling is important, even yeah. for high school. Yeah, have them turn the direction. That's why the point. I, I try to do the arrows to try to help them figure out um, with that. That's a huge one because they will do it backwards because they're just looking at it straight on and not spinning the paper. Um, I think one of the other things, this would not be a first lesson I would do for sure. They have, they wouldn't have a needed hat to have played with it mm -hmm. and like done the basic intro lessons first and messed around with it. Because if not, that's going to be half your class period is them playing with it and getting used to it. So that's definitely something. Um, I have not used Evo in my class yet. I just got my Evo kit. I've used Bit. And so one of the things with Evo is we need to make sure the kids don't take it until they're ready to start playing with it because his charge will die down if they have to keep reprogramming and everything. So I think a one per group as opposed to a one per child, um, unless you have multiple sets that you can give kids in case they die, is definitely something you want to look out for on a teacher aspect, like a prep aspect but definitely they need to have played with them beforehand and and done and i think done some playing around with ozo blockly as well i would i don't know that i would i might make this my intro to ozo blockly because it's only two or three squares so it wouldn't be that bad mm -hmm. but for high school in the math class i teach uh uh i would definitely um have to review reading with a protractor and all that stuff ahead of time too i think yeah we would definitely have to practice a lot with the ozo blockly even if it's just like a generic board just having them practice the codes um but the shape tracer is like a good practice you know start practice with it just because they have to practice putting in the codes yeah um, in ozo town and all that yeah um, and i'm I, uh, I just haven't finished my lesson so they'll be up there soon <laughs> That's a, that's a great suggestion. I'm going to do shape tracer as a distance learning and part of my PPL this year. Um, we had a question. Do you have to clear the program off the uh, Ozot bot? I wouldn't even worry about it. I would not even mess with it because I doubt kids are going to think about that. It's just like with our computers. We, I mean, calculators, we don't have them clear them. And I tell them, you trust me, you don't want to use what fourth period did, or you don't want to use what second period did and kind of mess around with them. But I wouldn't even wreck it. I wouldn't even, I would not worry about deleting it off. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's program by program. Yeah. And with uh, the shape tracer and all that, like it saves their progress, which I thought was good because, you know, mm -hmm. there's a, there's 10 levels and they might get tired and need a break. Or there was one that I, it was like, I kind of had the hard time of getting it down to the minimum number. And so it was nice to like go back and think about it. And so it's nice that it doesn't disappear, uh, especially if you're one to one, then they don't, mm -hmm. their progress is there, but we're not one-to-one -one at my school. Yeah, that's definitely something to think about. It will save it in your browser. So like if you have a lab, if you're a computer science teacher with a lab, uh, I'm not sure if they log on each time, if it changes the browser settings or cookies, but it, it, it does save as a cookie your progress in there. So that is something to think about. You wanna make sure you clear it out, which is just dragging the whole block off and putting it in the little trash can at the top. Yeah, so. Oh, go ahead, Laura. Does anyone else have any questions for us? I have a question. How, um, just for the educators out there who haven't uh, dived into Oza Blockly yet, um, how did you guys get started and how did you become comfortable in Oza Blockly? Um, I think just practicing with like Shape Tracer first because you can practice like put the Oza like link the, the bit or the Evo with it. Um, and I think just playing around, we also have, uh, our school has another robot that they have to put codes in. So that was good practice for them too. Yeah, uh, definitely shape tracer and for yeah. the kids too. That's, that's how I, I mean, it's an easy play with if they're at all familiar with block coding, which surprisingly enough, a lot of kids are, um, it's not too bad. Once you get in there, I think you could even just demonstrate like the one for this is only three blocks or four blocks. So I think you could even maybe teach them with an intro here, but I learned it with Shape Tracer for sure and Shape Tracer too. 
Um, and I would like when you're introducing with the kids, I would definitely give them time just to explore like because they're going to want especially a seven-year-old is going to want to see the different you know the the rainbow type things different things that it can do the first the first and second level are just a lot of fun to play mm -hmm. um if you're not doing like you know to go beyond the multiple choice on the webinar if you're going to do a map or something like that and it's not multiple choice those first couple of levels have a lot of fun stuff again though it takes a long time to load them as well so it's it's a different setting than maybe a multiple choice question but definitely play around with it all it's a lot of fun yeah if you don't have them with you over the summer i would definitely look at ozo town and the shape tracers and lisa mentioned something earlier that i just wanted to share some best practices about she mentioned that evo um that battery life can uh be the, the juice can just be uh uh can go quickly if um students are playing using a lot yes so um some of the things that we recommend are um when you are actually teaching or doing any type of direct instruction just having kids either put it in idle mode or not um turning them on until they're ready to use them um just to mm -hmm. conserve some of that battery power um and then also when they're programming in oza blockly um they're spending majority of their time within Oza Blockly and creating their content rather than executing their code most most of the time. So when they're not executing the code, you can show them how to put the bot into idle mode, which is just clicking that power button. So those are little things that you can do to help um, extend that battery life. Yeah. And I noticed this with a lot of use, like when I was doing my other lessons and I was doing like harmonious hijinks, it wouldn't last all the time, but I was traveling a lot and I was testing every code as I went. So some of those lessons, I do think it's better if they're in pairs so that you have kind of a set on reserve and a set there. And then if you have old Ozobots, if you have bits, pull those out if you're not using sound. I mean, have have all the ones that you can on reserve. Like I'm going to get ours from the library when we do those lessons so that I have plenty charged up, ready to go. And that's just, just ease on my part. But like she said, that's the one thing I feel like when you're doing Ozoblockly that you do need to think about because it is a involving a lot of movement a lot of traction on the tires and stuff for for evo but i don't see it being an issue in a, a class they charge really fast actually they charge probably in like 10 minutes like in between classes they would almost be charged back up so. all right great um Cassandra, do you know if we got any more questions in the chat that we in q a um someone's wondering if uh laura you could Go over your lesson one more time um, and just, uh, yeah, just how do the multiple cho choice questions relate with the, the map? Okay, so I got these questions off STEM scopes. There was a few that I made myself, but so like question one, I, I had put a little text box above the code that says question one. Um, so if it was um, nutrients, I would color it the the blue down here, it says nitro. Um, so I'd color blue, green, red. And I did the arrows just so the kids would know which way to go. And then I would go down to question two, which was what living thing must have, what, to living, what a living thing must have in order to survive. Um, so that would be our best basic needs. So I would color it the turbo. Um, and like this board, it can be generic. Like you could change your questions. Um, if it's, uh, you can edit it and delete stuff out, you could probably add another code in the corners. Um, it can work for any eight multiple choice questions, basically, that have three answer options. That is something that you, you would wanna look at. It has three answer options, any multiple choice question, and they just have to program it correctly. You could change it, like you could obviously change the ABC, or you could change it where the kids, they get to choose what, what their A is gonna be, what their B is gonna be, what their C is gonna be. Um, it's just our first one. I kind of gave them more structure with it than letting them have free reign over choosing the codes. But it's definitely, you know, adaptable. You could always, you know, color the extra ones black if you're not going to use them. Um, you could have them measure this whole thing and instead of have the blocks right there, have a blank and put it into Ozo Blockly. So they <laughs> had to travel the whole thing and they would have to do it here. So, I mean, you can really adapt it and, and differentiate. See, that's what happens when I read something. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> let's see what else. 
So you could even take it out if you got to that method, you know, even with your second graders and maybe do three questions or, you know, the first corner or something, they yeah. have to do Ozo Blockly. Yeah, so it's definitely, this was just the intro one that I got to do right before um, quarantine. Um, they loved it though. And it was, it was very easy for them to do on their own. So they were, I gave them like the answers, their questions first, uh, just cause I know some of them would skip the questions and go straight to coloring. Um, especially when there's 25 in the room. Um, so it was just a little bit more structure for them. And I think as they got more comfortable, you could totally, um, give them more free, like lenience and more direct or options to choose from. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Oh, there was another question that said, I'm struggling to understand how this is an assessment. Does the teacher watch to see what the Ozobot does? I actually do on a lot of my kids. I'm monitoring the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes do I make them sit there and play the whole thing for me? No, unless they're really excited and they want to show it to me. Um, I, I will grade them sometimes individually. I'll pick one here and there, but I'm watching them do it the whole time. I'm watching them. And if they have mistakes, I've already known it. We've already troubleshot it. So it's stuff like that, um, uh, that I look at as I'm doing it. Cause I, you know, I can see which groups are not doing what they need to be doing and stuff like that. So it does take constant monitoring for sure to make grading easier at the end. And then I just kind of grade it. Most of the times I will make it a completion with the uh, Ozo Blockly, I would go check what code they have typed up and make sure that they actually coded it. Or like if it's racing, they all need to keep it at the same speed. So I would go check their code on there. Um, as we were doing it, at least on a few, I would spot check here and there. Just kind of like sometimes with, you know, homework, you want to make sure they did five, six, and eight, correct? You know, and so sometimes stuff like that with, with ease of grading too. But if you're monitoring the whole time, you're going to know which groups have it down and which ones have reversed it and, and stuff like that, especially by like your second or third period, you'll have it down. Um, and with this, they can always turn in the seven questions or they mm -hmm. can turn in their code. Both. Um, and that's just a quick glance at it. Um, if it was like a math problem and you want to see their work, I'd probably have them turn in their work as well. It's definitely a formative assessment for them too. The, yeah you know, in both coding and the question itself, if you haven't pre-checked the question. Yeah, and Patricia actually just asked, how can they uh, give their code to the instructor? Um, how do you guys normally do it? I know there's a few ways I can talk of, but how do you find easiest? Um, I would probably have them screenshot it and put mm -hmm. it on uh, Seesaw. That's mostly what we use in second grade, but you could totally have them post it on Google Classroom. Um, I don't really know Canvas, but I'm sure there's a way. <laughs> Yeah, I would. Um, so speaking personally, we have a program called It's Learning. So you can make it an assignment that they have to screenshot it. And what I did with one of my remote lessons is they had to actually take a picture with their thumbs up in front of it so that they weren't just grabbing somebody else's screenshot and send it in or have it open where you can see their initials on the top of Google. Uh, that's something because uh, I know I had kids do that as well or they opened one of their emails or had one of their other assignments open so I knew it was theirs because with high school you've really got to think about I just sent this picture to Laura and I can just Laura can just turn it in I'm like nope you have to have a picture you open on your computer or something like that for a daily assessment I'd probably just have them screenshot it and send it to me um, it wouldn't be a big deal but when it was like virtual and that was their only assignment for the week they had to show me that they didn't just grab somebody else's so I had him take a picture and send the picture in and I, I feel like our kids would love to do like the screenshot and then the video and I with seesaw you can do both um, so you can see if it worked uh, especially if they're measuring yeah yeah and the only other I, I love that because then you can see uh, that it's really their work but there is also the option and students don't need to create an account to do this just in ozoblockly.com from the account tab Actually, should I share my screen real quick? Do we have time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Stop sharing. Okay. Show it. You guys can see it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. Okay. So basically, they would make a really riveting program here. <laughs> um, so basically, they would go here, and then you can do save as or get a share code. Um, and so basically, after you save it, um, it's going to create, why did it do that? 
a link. Okay. I'm going to need to look into that because it's not <laughs> signaling, even though it should. But, oh, okay. So I guess, yeah, I'll tell them about that. Um, but if you hit share, it will give you the link. Um, that seems like a more full foolproof way right now. And then the share code is something that you can just put into it if they a just document. The code. Yeah. And then, so you would just go and you'd be in your Oza Blockly editor and then you'd open a program, enter the share code and then it would pop up for you. So, yeah. That's awesome. I did not know that. That's nice. Yeah. It's a neat feature. <laughs> yeah. And they'll all be unique. So at least that way you'll know that like a student yeah. at least put it in themselves. <laughs> all right. All right, great. Um, if we don't have any more questions, um, I will unshare my screen. Oh, you just... oh, there we go. Thanks, Cassandra. Um, I just wanted to share a couple more things um, to wrap up. I wanted to thank both Laura and Lisa for joining us today and sharing their incredible content. Um, Let's see. Uh, so uh, for everybody in the audience, if you want to learn more or connect with other educators, um, you can join our Facebook group, um, Ozaba Academy. You can look for uh, that on Facebook. Um, if you're feeling inspired by what Lisa and uh, Laura had to share today, um, you can submit your own lessons on um, our lesson creator tool in Ozaba Classroom. And if you're new to Ozaba and you um, want to know more or you're interested in um, just yeah getting to know more and you can set up a uh demo with one of our steam specialists um and the short link is there ozo.bot slash request demo and some important information here if you are looking to um get a pd certificate you can email uh support at ozobot.com um our webinar this webinar will this recording will be up when um in the next couple of days on our youtube channel if you've opted in for updates you will get an email with this webinar recording and the slides, and you can also access it on our webinar page on um, our Ozabot website. Um, and if you have any questions for Lisa and Laura, um, their Twitter handles are there. So we just wanna thank everyone again for taking the morning um, uh, or lunch hour to spend with us to learn more and thank our certified educators, Laura and Lisa for joining us this morning as well. Hey, and, and Kathy just put something in the chat, I think that should be shared. She said, you can also pre-build them a code and send that share code with them and do it the opposite way. So that's really good for UCS teachers. That's neat. Sorry, yeah, I just want to share great, that. Great way to teach debugging too. If you want to uh, do a whole lesson around debugging, that's a really, really great to do the, uh, way to do that as well. So. And start out with which one doesn't belong. Yes. Because, yeah. yeah, that yeah. would be good. Uh, Lisa has some really great um, that which one doesn't belong is in our lesson library and also check if you check out her Twitter feed. Um, there's some really awesome um, content there. So um, and yes, Stephanie, um, if you want that PD certificate, email support at ozobot.com and they will get back to you. All right. Have a great day, everyone. And we will um, we will, oh, Lisa mentioned that one-to-one -one program. I just wanted to mention, um, we don't have enough time to cover that today, but we are going to host a webinar um, next Friday with some educators in Hong Kong that have rolled out a one-to-one -one program so that you can get um, an idea of what remote learning looks like. Um, they went into quarantine and shut down before we did, and um, they had to make some pivots, so they have a little bit more insight into um, what works and best practices around that remote learning, especially in the robotics um, field. So um, that will be happening next Friday and um, our, um, another team member will be joining myself to talk about that one-to-one -one program and how um, the different options of what that might look like for your school. So if you have any administrators or decision makers um, or other teachers that might be interested in that, I highly encourage you to register for that webinar and to attend next Friday. Um, and we have some Twitter chats happening next week as well on Tuesday and Wednesday. So check out our events um, and we will see you all soon. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.